500 years ago, Western religion went through a major reorganization. Before that, if one was, quote, religious, and, and I'm, I mean, basically, I mean in Western Europe and Southern Europe this time, what that meant was going to a church on Sunday, observing certain feast days and holidays, diet, certain types of diets, and basically to being an ordinary person, rather not a monk or a priest, what you basically did was just do various stuff. You went to church, you knelt, you said prayers, you might pray several times during the day and so forth, but it was a religion of activity and doing things. 500 years ago that changed, and that change was brought about by the invention of the printing press and movable type, which then made the Bible available basically to everybody, although not everybody could read at that time. In fact, even priests couldn't read it. Most priests couldn't read at that time. But what that did is to make text available to everybody. That is, religious text was democratized. And that democratization changed the nature of religion. And we're now in the wake of that particular period. Before then, activity was important. After then, the word was, and it might be beliefs, dogma, catechisms, texts, all those things are basically cognitive approaches to religion that have to do with a religion of words and of thoughts rather than of actions. And now this is basically the, what religion is now. If we ask somebody their religion, we don't expect them to tell us what activities, what rituals they perform. We expect them to tell us what their beliefs are. So we're still in this period of a verbal approach to religion. And this was the democratization of text. Now, what we're going through now is a, what I think is a big shift from a period of democratization of text to democratization of direct religious experience. And this is largely thanks to psychedelics. Now, people probably going back to Zog the, Gra the caveman have had experiences that we would call spiritual or religious. But there wasn't really um, institutionalized. And now I think we're seeing a transition as, as big now as it was happening 500 years ago with the transition of religion into our current verbal stage. So this is basically the theme when I'm, that I'm going to be talking about and give you some background on it. Whoop, they're not fans. There we go. The, the view is, basically comes from this. And that's to see religion not as a belief system so much as a type of experience, and experience basically a mystical experience. This is mystical as, as, as it's used in theology and the psychology of religion, not um, mysticism in the, like, well, we just had Halloween, in the sense that there might be a movie on TV, say, you know, zombies, three-headed zombies from outer space invade Area 51, and it might be listed as, quote, mystical. In the psychology of religion, mysticism is a, clump of very, uh, or a clump or several clump of very similar types of experience. There's all sorts of argument over exactly what composes a mystical experience. But we'll be talking about this. And you notice in this quotation, it says, isn't religion above all, before its doctrine and morality, rights and institutions, and the authors of this actually italicize that. That's not my adding. Now, what we're going to be looking at is how psychedelics are influencing doctrine, morality, rights, and institutions. So let's move on and take a look of, a bit at, um, at this, the theme. The theme of this, this talk is basically primary religious experience, which is, I call various things, state of unical, unitive consciousness, mystical experience, peak experience, and so on, is basically the taproot of religion, although it's an often neglected taproot. And what comes out of that is that beliefs, when they're based on primary religious experience, try to make sense to answer the question, what was that? What does that mean? That meaning the mystical experience or the primary religious experience. Rituals then attempt to create and celebrate and commemorate primary religious experience. Ethics then express the primary experience in terms of oneness, love, gratitude. So the source of morality comes from the mystical experience, not from what we're taught in texts or from church or for parents 
And finally, there are organizations that basically house all these activities. Now, I'm not saying that this is the only origin of religion, but this is a tributary into the flow of religion that is neglected, but thanks to psychedelics, that neglect is sort of disappearing. So let's take a look at where some of these show up. This is a characteristic of, my, of uh, mystical experiences. I couldn't remember all these sort of topics, so I asked my class to come up with good mnemonic device, and they came up with pot music, which is a pretty easy one to remember. It's not always easy to remember what all these characteristics are. Um, we won't go through all these in detail, but a couple of them are particularly interested. Uh, one is objectivity, also know, uh, known as a noetic sense. Noetic comes from the same root as knowledge, and it means a sense of having understood something, received some information, something th that is very important to know. Unity is a sense of decreasing one's identification with oneself and being able to identify with anything else. It might be a thumbnail, it might be all of humanity, it might be the cosmos, it might be any group of people. So the sense of I, me, and mine weakens and sometimes disappears. And uh, sacredness, there's a sense of holiness or sacredness. On the research that's done in this field, there's a standard instrument called the mysticism scale. The person who gives it says about half the time people report a sense of sacredness and about half the time they don't. So these are ingredients in a typical ideal example of a mystical experience. And not every mystical experience has all of these in the same amount or same mixture. It's just that we could have an ideal of a perfectly healthy human being. None of us would fit that role, but it's handy to have this idea of a perfect sample. So this would be a perfect sample of a mystical experience. There's an enormous literature on this and a lot of questions. What makes a legitimate mystical experience? What doesn't make a legitimate mystical experience? We can go into some of those questions later, I hope. So here's the main theme. We're going from a period of sacred rites to a period of sacred texts, to a period of sacred experiences. And the psychedelics make the sacred experiences more available. They are available lots of different ways. Okay, but because the psychedelics are generally available, this now means they have been democratized for our culture. This is a quotation of the transition that happened 500 years ago by Karen Armstrong. She's a former nun. This is a pile of her books, I think. I can't read all the titles, but she's written lots of books that have to do with theology and religion. And she points out the transition that happened 500 years ago. Instead of trying to get beyond language, Protestants would be encouraged to focus on the precise, original, and supposedly unchanging word of God in print. So she marks that change. And of course, the Protestant Revolution came out of this the uh, Reformation came out of this. Actually, nat nationalization was, came out of this because people started to identify with the language they speak. You'd be French speakers and German speakers and so forth. So the language base of, of nationalism came out at the same time as the idea of text written in one's particular language. So I think what we're seeing now is democratizing of entheogens, a very, just a parallel movement to what happened 500 years ago. This is from uh, the best uh, resource of the summary of psychedelic research. Um, and the authors are Lester Grinspoon and James Bacalar, both on the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Lester Grinspoon is a psychiatrist with a specialty in schizophrenia. And James Bacalar is a JD, a doctor of jurisprudence. And together you get a medical legal view of the research. Now this book came out, I think it was in 1975. It still, unfortunately, is one of the best books in the field. If you have a chance to buy it, get the paperback edition. The paperback edition has a glorious 40-page annotated bibliography. It's, it's an amazing job in there. The hardcover doesn't have it, so go for the cheaper pack or paperback one. Okay, here's an entheogen. Bruce mentioned that mentioned this morning. And it's a psychoactive plant or chemical used in a religious context and or when providing a feeling of sacredness. And there are some examples. The reason I have that and or is that in there is that a lot of cases, myself included, 
take, we took uh, psychedelics, in my case LSD, and had this mystical experience unintentionally. So I, wasn't, I didn't consider myself to be in a religious context. I was just taking it on a nice Saturday afternoon, and wham, whoa, what was that? Well, since then I've been studying mystical experiences, um, actually in theogenic experiences. There's an argument going over on now whether one should use the word psychedelic or theogen. I prefer to reserve psychedelic for the broad case of anything that happens within these, these chemicals and, pre and to reserve and theogen for the religious spiritual use. This N, as Bruce mentioned, N theo, there's the word God in the middle, theo, gen, generates, N theogen. This is the same etymology as enthusiasm. The thus is in, of enthusiasm is theo. Okay, now we're going to go through this sort of box by box, box and start off um, looking at um, beliefs. Stan Groff, that Bruce mentioned, is probably the best known researcher on psychedelics, had this experience. Even hardcore materialists, positively oriented scientists, skeptics and cynics, and uncompromising atheists, and anti-religious cru crusaders such as Marxist philosophers. Groff uh, grew up in uh, Czechoslovakia when it was under communist control, so this um, Marxist philosopher sort of comes from that experience, suddenly became interested in spiritual research, in the spiritual search, after they confronted these levels in themselves. And the level is the memory of the birth. Groff says we can remember our own births, although they're at a, at a very unconscious level. And when people experience the, their own birth and their own birth process, they started to get interested in religious, spiritual topics, which also came up when they went down to the level below that, called the transpersonal level. Um, this slide in the next one was actually written as a paragraph. I've bulletized it and put it into particular sentences to give you an example of the ideas that are in this and how you can take somebody's personal description of a psychedelic experience and turn it into a, a scale you can do research on. So each one of these can be like a Likert scale. A Likert scale is one of those, you've probably seen them, I agree very much, sort of like my experience, not at all my experience, and sort of check off along the line where this appears. And the main ideas are that the benefits and belief on mystical experience sort of are shown in this. The perennial philosophy and the esoteric teaching of all time suddenly made sense. Very much like my experience, not at all my experience. Okay. I understood why spiritual seekers were instructed to look within. The unconscious was, was revealed to be not just a useful concept, but an infinite reservoir of creative potential. I felt I had been afforded a glimpse into the nature of reality. There's that noetic sense, nature of reality, and the human potential within that reality. <coughs> Together with a direct experience of being myself, there's often a sense of, oh, I, know, I feel like I really am me now. This is where I'm supposed to be. This is my real me. A sense of myself, free of illusory identification and constructions of consciousness. This often expresses a sort of putting your identity to the side, like if I had a jacket on and I could say my jacket is Tom Roberts, I could put it off to the side and be surprised there's something left. This is the transcendent aspects of mystical experience. My understanding of mystical teaching, both Eastern and Western, Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, and Sufi alike, took a quantum leap. I became aware of all great religions and understood for the first time the meaning of ecstatic states. Francis Vaughn is a clinical psychologist, and now retired, uh, who was president of the Association for Transpersonal Psychology and has written several books on intuition and spiritual growth and transpersonal psychology. So this described her experience, taken actually back when psychedelics were legal. But talking about beliefs, there are interesting, interesting things that when people look at their beliefs from a psychedelic perspective. Some people sort of abandon their belief and say, oh, that was just a bunch of you know, superstition. Other people have their beliefs confirmed. Other people have sort of do a 180 degree on their beliefs. 
So this is interesting. Why do some people have one experience and some people do another? The great wonderful areas of do, doing research on psychedelics and religion that come out of this. This is from Antipodes of the Mind. Benny Shannon is a very well cogni known cognitive psychologist in Europe. And he went on a vacation to Brazil, got interested in ayahuasca, and did a lot of ayahuasca in his sessions himself, and uh, interviewed people who had done ayahuasca, and put this book together. If I were going to teach a graduate course in how to approach psychedelics um, from other perspectives, I would use this, because he intentionally hybridizes cognitive psychology and ayahuasca. So we have an example of how to approach a particular academic discipline from a, a psychedelic perspective and how to approach a psychedelic perspective from a disciplinary perspective. He, he, this is a very good example of mi mixing these together. And here's what Benny says about his experiences. If I were to pick one single effect of ayahuasca that had on my, the most important in, impact on my life, I would say that before my encounter with the brew, I was an atheist. And when I returned back home after my long journey in South America, I no longer was one. So there's one of the 80, 180 degree turns. So we can imagine doing all sorts of experiments now in religious studies. It doesn't have to be based on armchair philosophy, on reading texts, on reading what some religious leaders thought hundreds or thousands of years ago. But this moves religious studies into an experimental area and opens up a whole new possibility because all of these areas can now be examined experimentally through psychedelics. Let's take a look at rituals. Now each of these boxes sort of has a different amount of information behind it. So this is an attempt to recreate, celebrate, and or commemorate a primary religious experience. When I'm in church and we have communion, I think, oh, if they only knew what they were talking about. Uh, but they don't. OK, here we are back to our theme again. And we're going to be looking at beginning around 2000 and looking at the religious emphasis from psychedelics. So uh, rituals are methods of producing mind-body states that are experienced as sacred and or interpreted as spiritual. This is one of the curious things. Why, when so many people have psychedelic experiences, do they either experience directly a spirituality or interpret it spiritually? And there are a lot of ways of producing these experiences, mystical experiences. Entheogens are just one. All the others, or a lot of others, are listed there. So there are long traditions in every major religion that are, that are mystical in their approaches, although often they aren't well known. But you go to anybody who, looks, who knows about a religion, and they will be able to be able to say, oh, you should check you know, Saint so-and-so or this particular philosophy. So all these are ways of producing mystical experiences. Now, the production is always a sometimes thing. You can't do these and say, oh, I'm going to have a mystical experience. So why sometimes does it work and sometimes doesn't it work? Other questions that need to be looked at. This is the uh, Marsh Chapel that Bruce mentioned at um, Boston University, where there was a psilocybin study in 1962. And as he mentioned, there were 20 participants. They were all graduate students at Andover Newton Theological Seminary near Boston. Part had an active placebo and part had psilocybin. And um, they were attending a church service. This is the Robinson Chapel. It's in the basement of, of this uh, larger chapel of Boston University. And um, they afterwards described their experiences, and they took a sort of preliminary version of this mysticism scale that, that we saw. And sure enough, those that had the psilocybin basically had a mystical experience. That's interesting. This is sort of the one bookend of the study of, of religion through experimental psychedelics. Rick Doblin, who we also saw in the interesting tape that started it, decided to do a follow-up experiment. And this was basically 24 to 26 years later. So he was able to track down most of the people who took part in the, um, in the experiment. 
And what he found was this. Now, this is basically a quarter of a century later. Okay. All psilocybin subjects participating in the long-term follow-up, but none of the controls, people had the active placebo, still considered their original experience to have had generally mystical elements and to have made a unique, valuable contribution to their spiritual lives. Also, most of those who had had the psilocybin remained in as clergy, while uh, most of those who had not had psilocybin were no longer clergy. The numbers are too small to come out any statistically on this. But here's one of these wonderful anecdotal studies that sort of points to research that should be done in the future. Um, let me say another word about this. In the social sciences, experimental studies are not rare, but they're not as frequent as they should be. It's harder to set up a social science study, like in sociology or social psychology. And when they are done, they're usually done in a university laboratory research setting. And the people there are usually given uh, one treatment, and then it's measured more or less immediately afterward. The famous ones are, would you push somebody off a bridge in order to save the lives of somebody else, you know, five other people. That's the experiment that's often cited. So what happens then, of course, is that the results are reported for usually college students um, in this very restricted setting without impingements of all the other things that are going on in their lives. So it's questionable how accurate that is of how people would act out in the world and how long the effect of the treatment that was given would actually affect them. Now here's a treatment given once, not in a laboratory, but in a more or less act normal situation. Um, and it was measured at that time and a quarter of a century earlier. So this is an amazing treatment that you can give a, uh, a treatment in the sense of uh, experimental treatment that you can give somebody once and it'll affect them 25 years later. That's an amazing, not only that, but he found that several of the people, again, there's not a good statistical number that comes out of this, had actually increased their interest in their professions and in spiritual development in the treatment group, the psilocybin group, but not in the control group. So not only had this one treatment lasted 25 years, but apparently for some people it intensified. This is an amazing result. I don't know anything like it in the social sciences. So here's the Johns Hopkins, uh, one of the Johns Hopkins studies. Um, and um, Bruce was talking about meaningfulness. Here's the data on the spiritual significance. And again, they asked the people to rate the experience. Was this the single most significant experience in, spiritually in your life, or was it one out of the five, or would it be sort of something you might have every month or you know, every once in a while? 33% said it was the single most spiritually significant experience in his or her life. To get this in experimental situation is an amazing result because a lot of people basically don't have intense spiritual experiences and here they're able to give one in um, one of these nice living room like rooms but it was set up also with people who had a background of religious practice. It might be yoga, it might be meditation, it didn't have to be sort of going to an organizational church and they also screened out the people to see that they had uh, no psychological problems. So this is a, on a select group and does not generalize to the general population. But in addition to the 33%, another 38% rated it as, as being one of the top five most spiritually significant experiences. This is, the, this is an example of the Good Friday experiment advanced 40 years, or actually 50 years, um, to be replicated. And this is a nice example of how to do experimental research in religious studies rather than just humanunical interpretation of text or the psychology or sociology of religion. I really recommend this. It's a 19 minute talk in one of the TED, minute, TED talks. It's um, uh, Roland uh, Griffiths, who is the principal investigator of the Johns Hopkins studies, um, who is giving a nice 10 minute TED talk on this. These slides, very, uh, by the way, as I mentioned, are available at my website, and this tape will be put online at some point, so look it up here. You could also do probably a search for um, Roland Griffiths, uh, Johns Hopkins.
and click around and get it. A very remarkable um, talk. Okay, now let's transfer over to look at ethics and how do people's values change when they have mystical experiences. Again, what we're looking at is that mystical experiences have certain effects on people, whether or not they're brought about by psychedelics or a contemplative prayer or you're just walking along and suddenly zoom, you have a mystical experience. So the idea here is that when one drops the identification with oneself, motivation, so I, left, I call it the I, me, mine motivation, what's going to happen to me drops and people tend to more identify more with other groups, perhaps their own family, their own nation, or all of humanity, or even the whole cosmos. So when, ha when this happens, people's motivations change to match the change that they feel in themselves. So let's take a look at a few examples of this. This is the flow chart that I'm proposing. Transpersonal triggers, and you know the psychedelics is just one that I list there. These arrows are sometimes but not always arrows. So sometimes but not always produce primary religious experiences. Sometimes but not always affect what Maslow called the being values. And sometimes but not always result in moral action like life work dedicated to, to humanity, humane service, charity, and so forth. By the way, Ma uh, Maslow changed his needs hierarchy just before he died. And instead of self-actualization being at the top, self-transcendence is at the top. You can find this in the uh, introduction to the um, second edition of Total Psychology of Being. And he also has other, thing, other writings that, that talk about this. So this is the, the trend we're looking at and seeing where psychedelics might come into this. Now, this is from a, a book. We'll see the source of it later. This is not about psychedelic mystical experiences. It about, it's about mysti mystical experiences in general. Among the predictive characteristics of mystical experience are a sense of the sacredness of all life and a desire to establish a new, more harmonious relationship with nature and other human beings. What if we could provide this to? It wouldn't even have to be a large number of people, just a decent number of people. Would this change motivation away from what's going to happen to me to how can I serve humanity? Here's the rest of this quotation. And there is a corresponding renunciation of the various forms of self-seeking, including the ethos of manipulation and control. This is from David Wolf's Psychology of Religion, which is one of the two big psychology of religion uh, textbooks. This is a fascinating study. William Miller, uh, now retired, was a psychologist at the uh, University of New Mexico. And um, he specialized in uh, alcoholics. And one day, one of his patients came in and said, Dr. Miller, I had this wonderful experience and I've stopped drinking. Well, he sort of wondered, yeah, well, what was that? Um, but the guy did stop drinking. And then um, his a teenage daughter, who, like a lot of teenage daughters who are hard to get along with for their parents, had an experience and suddenly became like more mature overnight. So he got curious, I and mean, he thought he'd look, you know, look in the psychological literature. And what, is, what are these experiences? How do people have them? And how do I help people have them? So he put an ad in the Albuquerque newspaper, asked for people to contact him if they had had some sort of these experiences. He chose uh, 57 people who called, and he interviewed them about their experience and how it changed their lives. And this is the book that describes that. Now, none of these are with psychedelics. The point I want to make is that the, what the important part is the mystical experience. Again, this is not a pharmacological event. It's a pharmacological event that causes a psychological event, and it's a psychological event that counts on this. On the Johns Hopkins study of the 33% and 38%, those 33 and 38 were the people who had mystical experiences versus the volunteers who didn't have mystical experiences. So this is the big variable, the mystical experience. Now let's look at some of the data they found. Um, they asked, they gave people a list of 20, oh, 50 values and to rank them the way they felt before the experience and the way they felt after the experience. Now, they asked them to rank this after the experience. Okay, So this is not, exa not an example of 
ask people to rank, rank their value, give them a mystical experience, and then re-rank them. But it's, it's looking back at, this is the way I felt before, and this is the way I feel now. So these are just the top five. Curious on why some between men and women are different. Again, a lot of good research can come out of this. So for men, the first motivation was wealth and a change to spirituality. The second was adventure and a change to personal peace. For women, it started out with family and church to growth, and then from independence to self-esteem. So this is an example of approaching this sort of through naturally occurring mystical experiences. Um, this is a quotation from Stan Groff about the shift of values that happens during mystical experiences. When he's talking about responsible work with non-ordinary states of consciousness, he means LSD psychotherapy. Deep reverence for life and ecological awareness are among the most frequent consequences of the psycho-spiritual transformation that accompanies responsible work with non-ordinary states of consciousness. What if we could provide more people with reverence for life and ecological awareness? Now let's take a brief look at some of the organizations. This is the weakest of these four sort of boxes in the top row. Um, the, uh, American Buddhism has a lot of people in it who got into the field through their psychedelic experiences. They would have a mystical experience and say, whoa, what was that? What can I find out more about it? And um, Buddhism is very eager to talk about mystical experiences and very willing to do so. Tricycle is uh, the Buddhist journal, and they had a, a whole topical issue on psychedelics. They ran a survey. Again, this is a survey of you ask people to respond, so it's not or may not be very representative of the uh, population in general. But of the people who responded to this survey, 89% uh, engaged in Buddhist practice, so they got some non-Buddhists in this. 83% had taken psychedelics. This is interesting. 40% plus had, an, they had the interest in Buddhism sparked by psychedelics. And I think this illustrates the transition of increasing interest in experiential religion versus creedal religion. Okay? They, they said, oh, let's, let's take a look at this experiential religion. 59% said psychedelics and Buddhism do not, or do mix. 41% say they do not mix. The idea generally was that in a mystical experience through psychedelics sort of gave them a, it's like a trailer for spiritual development and thinking, okay, now how do I get there on their own? And many went into uh, to study Buddhism. 71% says psychedelics are not a path but can provide a glimpse of the reality to which Buddhist practice points. That's that trailer idea. This zigzag Zen is a bunch of interviews with Americans who are Buddhists and have a psychedelic, psychedelic interests. I'll be talking a bit more and showing some of these books. Houston Smith um, is one of the world's great uh, philosophers of religion. Um, he, uh, if you took a comparative religion course, chances are you used his book called World Religions. And um, he also was uh, interviewed by um, Bill Moyers on a series called Faith Traditions in the spring of 1996. I suppose you can get it online, I don't know. But he also uh, wrote this book with Reuben Snake on the Native American church, um, which uh, was under fire for using peyote and they managed to actually get two laws passed which allowed them to, um, to use peyote. Ayahuasca, mentioned as, the, as a Brazilian-based Brazilian plant medicine. Um, and there are two churches in the United States that um, use uh, ayahuasca. Unio de Vegetal is uh, in Arizona or New Mexico. They had a... Uh, barrel of ayahuasca tea shipped into the United States. Customs seized it because it had the illegal substance of DMT in it. The church sued Customs to get it back. Um, there was a bench or a three-judge hearing. The two out of the three favored in, in favor of the church. So the Drug Enforcement Administration appealed it, and they had an area bench trial, which is all the judges in a particular district heard it, and they decided to change in favor of the church. 
So the DEA appealed it to the Supreme Court, okay? And the Supreme Court voted eight to nothing in favor of the church. The reason it wasn't nine was that Judge Roberts uh, had been appointed to the court after the hearing, and so he couldn't vote on it. And what they actually decided to do is to return it to the district court to reconsider it. Well, when there's a unanimous vote from the Supreme Court to reconsider something, and you're on a district court, you pay a lot of attention to that. And Santo Daimi, Nick was one of the, or one of the expert witnesses in that. You can probably update me on, on this. Um, last I knew, um, they were allowed, they are allowed to import ayahuasca, is that right? Is that, is that complete now, or are there, are there appeals going on? Well, they are, the Department of Justice appealed, but my understanding now is that they've dropped their appeal. Oh, okay. So the uh, Judge Panner's ruling stands. So they're able then to use ayahuasca? Yes. Good, all right. Here in Oregon. Ah, yes, all right. This is a summary of, of what I'm having to say. The first column lists a number of topics. The second column, that topic as it appears in our current verbal word or text oriented um, life. And the third column, how it might develop as we moved into a period of experimental religion. So the, the first picture there, of course, is Gutenberg, and there's his Bible right below it. I've chosen um, R. Gordon Wasson to represent um, movement, and current movement toward um, experiential religion. There are a number of people who might follow this, but Wasson uh, got interested in psychedelic mushrooms and went all over the world studying them, and there's the Amanita mushroom below it. So what got democratized 500 years ago was the printed word, and what gets democratized now is primary religious experience. The route to spiritual knowledge now is reading, study, thought, cognitive processes, and in the future, it's probably going to be mystical experience. Spiritual knowledge now is belief, doctrine, dogma, ideology, theology, all this verbal stuff, okay? And in the future, it's likely to be unmediated direct perception that is a mystical experience. There's a shift in um, academic disciplines from theology and philosophy, which are basically words, to biology and psychology, which are basically experience. Ethical action, well, we have the Decalogue, you know, do this and don't do that. And um, in the future, I think we will have the sort of values that were, uh, came out of mystical experiences that we saw in that quantum change book. And religious education switches from reading and understanding and interpreting sacred text to experiencing transcendence. So there we have the, the path that I think that we're on. Um, this is not something that's going to happen overnight or even in one or two or probably three generations. But I think we have to think of religion not only as what people believe, but the type of experiences they have and how they go about generating those experiences. Uh, Houston Smith, who I mentioned, wrote this book called Cleansing the Doors of Perception. He had written over the years uh, nine or ten articles on his understanding of the use of psychedelics in a spiritual path. He spoke out at Northern a couple of years ago, and I collected them together and then sent it to him, and he sort of polished them up, updated, and came up with this book, Cleansing the Doors of Perception. Higher Wisdom, the subtitle says it all, Eminent Elders Explore the Continuing Impact of Psychedelics. So these are people who have 30, 40, and 50 years of experience with psychedelics, looking back at them throughout their lifespan. I mean, imagine what somebody who's had psychedelics for 50 years gains perspective. Let's suppose you're 20, okay? And then suddenly, when you're 70, you look back at what you're like when you're 20. Right? That, that's the perspective these people uh, drive on it. Higher wisdom. Excellent collection. Um, Entheogens and the Future of Religion has just been republished. Um, it and my book, Spiritual Growth Within Theogens, are both anthologies, and they're published by Inner Traditions uh, in um, Rochester, Vermont. I think they both have a really nice collection of, of contributions. Spiritual Growth Within Theogens came out of a conference that I helped organize with the Council on Spiritual Practices 
and um, Chicago Theological Seminary. And we invited about 30 to 35 people there to talk about the growth of, of spiritual development within theogens. And we asked people to write chapters afterwards, um, sort of analyzing their own views. So these were not the papers at the conference, although a few are very parallel to it, or really people's reflective on, on these afterwards. Um, there's a, a slightly longer version of the talk that I've just given you online here. Um, it's a talk I gave at a church in Madison in uh, December 2009. Um, basically what you've seen here only um, with a, some extra comments and a lot of good questions afterwards. So here's what I think this all comes to, to adapt a poem by William Blake. Children of a future age, reading this indignant page, know that in a former time, a path to God was thought a crime. 